as 2023 comes to an end in a couple of hours, I thought let's look back at some of the most puzzling choices in the world of Linux in the last year. And we're going to do a semi bit of a deep dive into a couple of really eye rousing topics. So uh, let's start in no particular order. One of the things, of course, has been OpenSUSE rebranding their desktop environment, or should I say their marketing. So essentially, they've had the same logo since 2003, and they've recently been working on changing that to a newer logo. And the idea behind that, of course, is to make sure that uh, there isn't confusion between, the, between SUSE Linux and OpenSUSE Linux and the various foundations. However, I don't have a problem with this, except for the fact I think it's seriously wasting resources considering at the moment the OpenSUSE community still has no clue what's going to be the fate to OpenSUSE Leap. Yes, you get OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, which is of course a roading distribution, but OpenSUSE Leap has literally been the equivalent of having SUSE Linux, etc. So basically kind of been the you could say the sent us to Red Hat as it were. Now, of course, one of the things that's happening is Suzy itself is going to be transitioning to their new ALP platform, which means they're taking a container approach, so that distribution is going to change. And of course, folks have been unsure how will this affect OpenSUSE. So it looks like in future, OpenSUSE might uh, uh, basically still keep their rolling distribution or tumbleweed and of course leap might be replaced by slow roll which is like tumbleweed but a little bit uh, slower so it gets uh, updates but uh, more rigorously tested and not rolled it as quickly or linear right might replace it which is essentially a bait basically a container type of approach but yeah i was wondering what is open doing changing marketing if uh, people aren't too sure what is going on that's kind of like uh, rearranging decks on the Titanic while the ship is sinking and half the crew has no idea where the lifeboats are. So, open source, hopefully 2024 is going to be a better year for you. Ah, yes. And, of course, no one can have a list like this if you can't include Red Hat. So, unless you've been living under a rock or been living on a different planet for this year, Red Hat, of course, decided to close off the public access to their source code and put it behind a restrictive EULA subscription agreement. So, in other words, you have to pay Red Hat to get access, unless, of course, you specifically go through the additional open software that is available, but, of course, uh, the way the source code is now released, it's not as easy to identify which changes for which change. So other distributions have had to step in and fill that gap, but it's made it a lot harder to keep parity. For example, distros such as Oracle Linux or Alma Linux, etc., have had to just gone and put in extra effort, and various foundations have been put in. Of course, there's been a big debate about this because the GPL license uh, kind of, it's a bit of a loophole, but how Red Hat has done this is basically told folks, well, since uh, we also have a Euler subscription, if you share the source code directly, you are in breach of that. So, hey, good luck. There's been various debates and topics on this throughout the year, and it will be interesting to see what happens next year. Um, but yeah, it was a really shocking and disappointing thing in the open source community, but it looks like with the newer different foundations that have been formed, I uh, think should carry on relatively as normal, but really a outrageous uh, move. Ah, yes, Wayland. So if you are an X11 XORG lover and you really hate Wayland, it does look like that t the time is starting to tick to an end for us. And the reason I say that is, well, Fedora 40 plans to remove X11 support for the KDE edition. Uh, it's going to be using KDE 6, which is said to be 100% fully Wayland compatible and really awesome distribution or software package, should I say, rather. So the signs are there, of course, to move that. If you're a person that likes to use your enterprise Linuxes, for example, something that's based on RHEL, well, Red Hat has announced that from RHEL version 10, that's also going to be Wayland only. So it looks like it might not happen tomorrow or the day after, but the future is... Wayland. Whether 
Unfortunately, it's at the point of whether we like it or not. It's just uh, the momentum that everything is going in. So let's hope this tiny bugs that still exist will be over soon. Ah, yes, Ubuntu. The distribution for human beings. The distribution that once made Linux accessible. And the distribution that really ends up in the media sometimes for all the wrong reasons. So unless you're not sure, Ubuntu Advantage, of course, is a... Uh, Prescript, a subscription package where you can get additional updates for your LTS editions of Ubuntu. I think the first five uh, workstations are free, but essentially what this is, when you're dealing with Ubuntu from the CLI, you might get a message that will tell you to sign up for Ubuntu Pro or Advantage if you haven't already. And previously in the past, this was handled by removing the Advantage package or making whatever if other changes to your system so you don't get these little annoying alerts. Unfortunately, this year Ubuntu decided to make the Ubuntu Advantage package a requirement of Ubuntu Core Minimal. Meta package. So what does that mean? If you remove it, goodbye, you've broken your system. It will remove multiple other core packages. Look, I get Ubuntu's trying to uh, push this as much as possible. And... I'm sure they have their reasons, and I understand that. But this really, I've got to admit, tends to irk me the wrong way. Like, making a part of a core cool package? Seriously, they know fair well that it is not a core cool package. And it can continue to function quite well without it. So, Ubuntu, canonical, seriously? What's next? I know, don't, and please, someone don't mention snap packages. Then we're not going through that today. That's a whole other lifetime. And Debian or Debian Linux, of course, plans in future to drop 32-bit or x86 support for uh, regular processes. So essentially, this is still some time away, but the plan is in future there will be no more 32-bit uh, kernels, installation media for 32-bit uh, x86 machines from Debian. The idea, of course, is to start phasing away this legacy stuff and move into the future, which, of course, is x64. But, and let's also be honest, though, on the other side of the spectrum, 64-bit uh, has been around for many, 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 many years, and a lot of machines can support it. Of course, there are those wild machines out there that only will support 32-bit, and those usually are often used in factories type of environments. So you'd like to hope that if those machines are locked down and set up correctly and in an isolated environment, that they'll continue to run on possibly whatever the last version of Debian will be that will run 32-bit. But uh, hopefully it won't impact people. But uh, yeah, it's kind of sad, but I guess technology has to move on one way or another. Although I do wonder how this will in future impact uh, applications such as Wine on Linux since I use this 32-bit packages. But hey, we'll see. And lastly, of course, uh, System D. Yes, System D. No matter who you ask, sometimes the joke is these days Linux is System D with GNU on top of it. So the system D that started off initially as init system, which can now do the time, networking, home user management, booting, be a boot manager, has decided that uh, it's not big enough yet and uh, has added a new component as of version 255, system D-BSOD. Uh, BS, BSOD, yes, blue screen of death. So essentially what this is going to be, it's going to be Linux, uh, will be catching up with Windows in this instance, and it will be generating a full screen display of error messages when the Linux system crashes. So it's kind of like Linux gets its own blue screen of death. Yes, I, I know technically speaking, let's be honest here, when a Unix or Linux or Nix machine crashes, it generally does have a kernel panic, and the idea is that hopefully around that, uh, these messages will make more sense. The idea is to also, as with Windows, add additional uh, QR codes so that you can scan the error message and find out what's caused it. So, yeah, some folks might be saying this is system D encroping on everything again. 
and we'll just have to see what happens there. But yeah, I'm looking forward to in future seeing all the screenshots of the Linux blue screens of death. Fortunately, I couldn't find any examples for those. But yeah, it's coming. So folks, uh, thank you for watching, listening. Let me know what you think of this list. If there's anything else uh, you think I left out or should have covered, feel free to add it in the comments below. Folks, wishing you a great uh, new year and a 2024. I'll talk to you on the other side. As always, thanks for watching and goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.